what we'll do now is a brief discussion on problems of units first we'll say a few words about blank units natural units and then we'll talk about astronomical system of units and then we'll be speaking about uh, heaviside Lorentz unit and then we'll do certain problems to end up this lecture in lecture p2a we discussed about natural units and in lecture p2b we discussed about Planck units now natural units corresponded to h cross equal to 1 c equal to 1 while as discussed in lecture p2b Planck scale was all about building these values or combination of fundamental constants and they are known as Planck mass, Planck length, Planck time and in Planck scale it is convenient to put them equal to 1 and do some calculations. We also defined what we mean by Planck energy which is MPLC square and whose value in GeV is of this amount and from here we can also define the Planck temperature put the value of EPL that is Planck energy and divide it by the Boltzmann constant to end up with a huge value of temperature which is 10 raised to the power 32 Kelvin let us speak a few words again about Planck era when an event occurs we often ask where did the event occur what was the timing of the event and what led to the event why did the event happen in other words what happened before the event that naturally gave rise to that event now such questions where when how and so on so forth should have certain context and if questions are out of context then questions become meaningless for instance if in a cricket match we ask how many goals have been scored or who scored the goal then that simply is ridiculous so sometimes therefore questions do not make any sense just because they are out of context so questions will be meaningful only if they are glued or fixed to the context. In case of an event called Big Bang, of which we know nothing, we say that universe burst into existence, it, universe exploded and we are here after that event. Based upon our current understanding of our present times, uh, we are raising questions about an event that occurred 10 to the power 9 years ago. So our questions might not fit to that event that happened in the Planck era. The question therefore such as where did Big Bang happen, when did it happen or what happened before Big Bang may not hold water they may be out of context the question itself may have no meaning what we know is what happened after the universe kicked off so something happened here in the Planck era which is called Big Bang but our knowledge is limited to events after that that is in this period of time starting from 10 to the power minus 44 seconds to 10 to the power 9 years a point of time where we are presently in though we have some knowledge about things in this period of time we have no inkling about the Planck era and certain other things 
and they are at Planck time which is 10 raised to the power minus 44 seconds gravity force might have separated from other forces and this is referred to as spontaneous symmetry breaking which we will discuss later on in some lecture and also we will speak about the various types of forces in a coming lecture. Now this Planck era as mentioned in the previous lecture it looks like a black hole there is a singularity there and beyond this event horizon we have no information this region is hidden from outside world that is after some event occurred here which is called Big Bang and after this period of time the concept of time the concept of space started or became meaningful now in this region all known laws of physics fail and after Planck time the laws of physics are applicable what is again more interesting is at this instant of time the entire universe was smaller than a proton so its size was very very small nearly zero it had infinite amount of energy 10 to the power 19 GeV and the temperature was also infinity 10 to the power 32 Kelvin Planck temperature in future in a future lecture we may address these issues elaborately we will now come to the astronomical system of units which is used in astronomy and the astronomical unit of time is one day denoted by capital D which is 86400 seconds 24 hours a day 60 minutes per hour and 60 seconds per minute that makes up 86400 seconds the astronomical unit of mass which is called solar mass sometimes denoted by the symbol m subscript and n circle dot is 2 into 10 to the power 30 kg and these are approximate values the length which is used in astronomical system of units is taken to be the distance between earth and sun which has this amount of value 1.5 10 raised to the power 11 and it is called a dot u astronomical unit some other units are often used and they are light year denoted by ly which is the unit of distance it is the distance that light travels in one year in vacuum so it is c into t c being the speed of light in free space and we are speaking of light years so one year is involved here and if you multiply we get 9.5 10 raised to the power 15 meters in SI system another unit that is used often and is very popular is parsec denoted by pc parsec is a unit of distance let us consider one astronomical unit of distance that separates earth and sun and let this point be a point of observation now if this ast one astronomical unit of distance makes an angle one second at this point of observation then this distance is called one parsec let us focus attention to this right angle triangle and let us find the tan of this angle now tan is perpendicular by base and therefore we have tan of 1 by 3600 degree here we have converted one second into degrees in view of this relation that 1 degree 60 minute and 60 minute 
means 16 to 60 seconds 1 minute is 60 seconds and therefore we get to this result and then perpendicular here is one astronomical unit and base is one PC and therefore uh, let us put one astronomical unit 1.510 to the power 11 meters as stated before and therefore this gives us the value of one PC to be of this amount 3.1 to the power 16 meters so we have made a gist of one astronomical unit light year and PC and obviously a comparison shows that one astronomical unit is the smallest distance while one PC or per sec is the largest unit let us check whether our calculations are correct let us evaluate the time taken by light to reach from Sun to Earth and the value of which we know to be 8 minute 20 second now since light travels this distance with speed C C being 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second we have this formula distance is velocity into time from which we have time as distance by speed distance is the distance between Sun and Earth which is one astronomical unit the value of which is this one that if we divide by speed we end up with 8 minute 20 second so our figures are right and also let us try to find the conversion factors between light year and astronomical unit one light year is 9.5 10 to the power 15 meters and let us divide it by one astronomical unit and multiply it by one astronomical unit now instead of this one astronomical unit in the denominator let us put its value explicitly and then simplification gives us 6.3 10 to the power 4 astronomical unit is equal to 1 light year in the same manner let us calculate 1 PC so 1 PC the value of it being this one and let us multiply it by 1 light year and divide it by 1 light year and then put the value of 1 light year in the denominator and then take the ratio to end up with 3.26 light year so this is a very standard value so 1 per sec is 3.26 light year also earth mass something we use is earth mass which is 6 into 10 to the power 4 kg and it is related to the solar mass through this relation 3 into 10 to the power minus 6 the solar mass is 1 earth mass let us now move over to natural units and some consequences thereof in natural units we choose length and time to be of same uh, dimension and this is expressed as energy inverse so that energy into time has no dimension and also as mentioned earlier in a separate lecture p2a that mass is measured in gv length in gv inverse and time in gv inverse now from quantum mechanics the unit of action h cross is put one in natural units and from special theory of relativity the speed of light which we get is also taken to be one in natural unit now this choice was motivated because the rest mass of proton has a value of 1 GeV so these choices will simplify problems because we take in this natural unit the rest mass of proton to be 1 GeV actually the mass is 938 MeV and this is of the order of 1000 MeV which in other words is 1 GeV so in equations of particle physics h cross and c will not appear and everything is expressed in terms of energy unit momentum momentum is mass into velocity velocity is length by time and as length and time are in same units both in gv inverse they cancel out and we are left with just mass and again mass is measured in units of gv 
So momentum is expressed in terms of GV. Energy is force into distance and we can explicitly write down the dimension of force and since length and time are of same dimension therefore they cancel out and we are left with again m so energy is gv energy is mc square as per einstein's famous relation and since c is one in natural units it is m and m is in gv now in particle physics therefore let us make a gist natural units are h cross equal to 1 c equal to 1 and in particle physics the mass of proton the rest mass of proton is taken to be 1 gv but we have to deal with electromagnetic equations also which involves for instance the coulomb's law which involves an epsilon 0 which is permittivity of free space and what will its value be Heaviside Lorentz units are used to tackle this problem and in this system of units, heaviside Lorentz natural units, epsilon 0 is put to be equal to 1. So the Coulomb's law takes this simplified form where epsilon 0 is 1. Now therefore, what is the dimension of charge? And from here Q is just F into L square under root. Put the value of F explicitly. And therefore simplifying the dimensions we end up with this relation. Now in natural units we have GV for M, GV inverse for L and GV inverse the same thing for T. Charge is dimensionless in heaviside Lorentz units. Let us speak about the strength of electromagnetic interaction which is measured in terms of fine structure constant whose value is 1 by 137 and whose expression in terms of other fundamental constants given as follows. Now from here we can find mod e square which represents electronic charge expressed in terms of epsilon 0 h cross c now here if we put the heaviside Lorentz natural unit system which says epsilon 0 1 h cross 1 and c 1 then what we end up with is e is just under root 4 pi alpha alpha being the fine structure constant and if we put its value to be 1 by 137 we have this one now from calculator if we calculate it it turns out to be E equal to 0 0.3028. Now the value of E in SI system is 1.610 to the minus 19 coulomb and therefore their equality means this much coulomb is set equal to 1 in heaviside Lorentz system of natural units. Also such choice of epsilon 0 equal to 1 leads us to mu 0 equal to 1 because we have the standard expression c is 1 by under root epsilon 0 mu 0 if mu if epsilon 0 is 1 then mu 0 is 1 because c is 1 so this is a gist of what we have in heaviside Lorentz system of units h cross c epsilon 0 mu 0 all are set equal to 1 and the equations some equations of physics shown over there they look a bit simpler here we do not have any c so we have e square equal to p square plus m0 square the famous equation p equal to h cross vector k becomes just p equal to vector k the maxwell's equations with epsilon 0 and mu 0 1 takes a simpler look Let us speak of cross section now. Cross section is an extremely important parameter that is used in particle physics. It represents the area of target 
which a projectile sees and interacts with. Suppose a projectile is hitting a target. Now, how does the target appear to the projectile? What area of the target is being aimed at by the projectile? This is called cross-section. And obviously this depends upon the energy of the projectile. If projectile is dominant, if projectile has huge amount of energy, then it will see more of the target. But if its capability is less, it will see a small portion of the target and the interaction will be less. So, cross section is all about how projectile behaves with the target, how it interacts with the target. We will discuss it later in a separate class. Now, cross section is therefore measured by area and unit of area in SI system is meter square. And a very standard definition is one burn written as 1b is set equal to 10 raised to the power minus 28 meter square. Now in particle physics, in natural system of units, as we showed in lecture 2a, 1 meter is 5.07 10 raised to the power 15 GeV inverse. And if we put it here, and do some calculation, simple calculation, we get to this important result. 1 burn equal to 2570.5 GeV raised to the power minus 2. So this is how cross section rep is represented in particle physics. Also, 1 GeV raised to the power minus 2 is therefore 0 0.389 milli burn, where milli stands for 10 raised to the power minus 3. Let us now do some problems. Let us try to find the de Broglie wavelength of 1 GeV photon. De Broglie wavelength is given by this famous formula lambda is h by p and h can be replaced by h cross at the cost of 1 2 pi here. So we have this formula 2 pi h cross by p. Multiply if we multiply by C in the numerator and denominator, we have this formula. And here we have shown why we brought a PC here. The photon is involved in this problem. And for any particle, the relation between energy, momentum and rest mass is given by this formula, which follows from Einstein's special theory of relativity. Photon has zero mass. So this term goes off and we end up with E equal to PC. So in the next step, we can put E for PC and therefore we have this formula. Now in these problems, we will be using natural units. So H cross 1 C1, therefore we have a simplified version of the formula lambda is 2 pi by E. Now energy of photon is given to be 1 GeV. And therefore we can write lambda is 2 pi by 1 GeV and in an earlier lecture P2A we proved that 1 GeV inverse can be written as 0 0.197 Fermi and Fermi is 10 to the power minus 15 meters and therefore putting it back we end up with 1.24 Fermi. So this is the answer we did this problem in natural units to end up with this result. And then we reverted back to the standard way of expressing things. Here we have expressed it in terms of Fermi. But in natural units we have to express it in terms of 2 pi GeV inverse. Next problem is to find the Compton wavelength. Now Compton wavelength which is an important parameter that comes in the analysis of Compton scattering which will be done in quantum mechanics class. So this is the formula and the reduced Compton wavelength involves a division by 2 pi. So we can divide it by 2 pi and then we have lambda cut c. And here also h by 2 pi 
is involved therefore we have h cross by m0 c so compton wavelength is h by m0 c but reduced compton wavelength is h cross by m0 c and in the symbol we have a cut here here there is no cut and natural units can be used and therefore these h cross and c goes off and we have a very simple formula lambda cut c is 1 by m0 where m0 is the rest mass now various particles can be thought of and their rest mass put here to end up with the results for instance pion is a particle of which we will be speaking in a later class about uh, where we will be discussing classification of elementary particles now consider a pion it has rest mass 140 mev and if you put the value 140 mev and then m is 1 uh, 10 to the power 6 and we can convert it into gv gv is 10 raised to the power 9 ev and therefore we have this value and now one gv inverse is 0 0.197 fermi which when put here leads to 1.41 fermi so this is the compton wavelength of a pion in a similar manner the compton wavelength of an electron can be found out electron has rest mass energy of 0 0.51 mev which when put here and then convert it to gv we have this value and then gv inverse is 0 0.197 fermi if we put it here take the product we get 386 fermi so this is the compton wavelength of an electron in a similar way we can also find the compton wavelength of a proton and this is an extremely easy task because proton as mentioned earlier in particle physics we take its value to be 1 GeV energy or mass and therefore if you put it here we end up with reduced Compton wavelength to be 1 GeV inverse and using the conversion we get 0 0.197 Fermi so these are very important results in the next problem let us uh, find classical electron radius which represents a special extension of electrostatic self energy of electron so the given expression is this one and here epsilon 0 is 1 c is 1 in heavy side Lorentz units and the value of electronic charge is of this amount which we deduced a little while earlier and therefore if we place all these things with rest mass energy of electron to be 0 0.51 MeV we end up with 14.3 GeV inverse which when converted back to Fermi we get 2.8 Fermi which is the standard value of classical electron radius the Bohr radius next the Bohr radius is the radius of the lowest energy orbit of hydrogen atom and it has this expression a very standard expression and if we put h cross epsilon 0 to be 1 and e of this amount then we get the value of 0 0.53 angstroms of Bohr radius which can be also obtained from other methods let us now discuss about the lengths that can be associated to an electron for instance we can speak of classical electron radius its value or structure is given here and its value was obtained to be 2.8 Fermi so its electrostatic self energy of electron that is distributed over this radius spherical distribution we can speak of Bohr radius which gives the maximum radial probability density of the electron cloud that surrounds a nucleus uh, to be specific hydrogen nucleus in this case so its value is 0 0.53 angstrom and its structure is given over there we can associate another length called Compton wavelength to an electron the reduced Compton wavelength is given by this expression and its value is 386 Fermi which we got just now it has some significance which is as follows 
One is that it represents the wavelength of a photon that carries an energy same as electron rest energy. So we have this equation that leads to the expression for reduced Compton wavelength. Another significance is that lambda cut of electron represents the lower limit of localization of electron. We cannot localize an electron to a distance shorter than lambda cut. Suppose we use a photon of energy E equal to PC to localize an electron within delta X. Now E equal to PC leads to delta E equal to delta P into C and so from Heisenberg's uncertainty relation delta P is H cross by delta X we have this relation. Now to avoid particle production delta E should be low that is less than twice m0 c square and so we get this relation. This gives delta x lambda cut E. If we wish to confine an electron within this distance that is delta x less than lambda cut E then we need an energetic photon having energy greater than twice m0 c square that would lead to particle production so if we try to locate one particle one electron will end up detecting multiple electrons and this makes no sense clearly thus essence of measurement is then meaningless below this value lambda cut e that is com reduced Compton wavelength. In that situation we need other theories like quantum field theory and this has been described in lecture P3A. Let us make a gist of what we did we can com we have compared here the various lengths the classical electron radius and the reduced Compton wavelength of electron if we take the ratio we end up with alpha which is 1 by 137 while the ratio of classical electron radius to the Bohr radius gives us alpha square which in other words means that the ratio of Bohr radius to reduced Compton wavelength to classical electron radius is of this value and it is clear that the largest is Bohr radius, next is Compton reduced Compton wavelength and classical electron radius being the least among these three. To end up, let me quote Scordis, who is a physicist. We should be testing general relativity regardless because you should test any theory it is part of physics to test everything and indeed this is the beauty of physics.